This is really exciting for me. Uh, as someone who really, for most of my career, has worked in what I would call short-form communication. Radio newscasts are very short. One of the experiences I resented most in my radio career, but that in retrospect was maybe one of the most rewarding experiences of my time, was creating newscasts that were 95.5 seconds long. <laughs> I thought, that's kind of ridiculous. But it taught me the value of every word. And you, on the other hand, uh, I would imagine, are in your careers maybe more dedicated to long-form communication, books, for instance. Um, but this is where what we're going to explore today is where those worlds intersect. Short-form communication, the subject line, the headline, the book title, is how we get people from where they are to where we want them to be in the middle of a book or a movie or an audio recording, almost said tape. Headlines, as we'll be discussing today, are more than things in newspapers. Headlines are how we decide what to watch on YouTube. Headlines are how we connect in social media. The second one is no longer true. <laughs> it was when I posted it, but it's not anymore. Headlines are how we determine what we're going to click on in email, which is one of the main things we'll be talking about today. A little bit about why you might want to listen to a, a radio guy. And at my core, that's probably the essence of what I have been for much of my career. Um, but one reason is because for radio, the competition has always been a click away. Very old radio, going on 100 years now. Uh, almost from the start, radios have had buttons. So radio has always been in this world where the competition is a click away. And now it's the world that, that we all live in. Whether you're selling shoes, or news, or podcasts, or getting people to check books out of the library, or come visit your library, uh, the competition is a click away. That bookmarks bar across the top is always there. Uh, even on your website, there may be links in the rails that are taking people, or at least tempting people, to leave whatever it is that they're looking at now. And in the world of smartphones, even if you've gotten them to open your email, there are pop-up notifications and Facebook alerts that are popping up and saying, no, come look at me, come look at me. So the competition is always nearby. And in this world, the question we all face, whatever our occupations, so long as we're trying to ply our work in the digital space, is how do we get that audience? How do we keep that audience? And how do we grow our audience? And, and I'm here to say that headlines are the key. And by headlines, as we talk about it in this discussion, headlines, you can substitute whatever you'd like. Tweets, Facebook posts, subheads within your email, email subject lines. It's basically, hey, look at this. Email is an invaluable tool for figuring out what works and what doesn't, which headlines activate your audience. And again, before we push ahead, uh, some of you may say, well, how does he know what he's talking about? Why should I believe him? Does this work, w whatever he's going to tell us? And I'm here to offer some assurance that, yes, it does. Um, I learned what I know by launching and running the Tribune's email services for a decade, uh, Tribune Day Watch, and alerts, which I think everyone kind of takes for granted now that your favorite news organization is going to send you an email alert when something happens. At the Tribune, I was the person who first pressed those buttons to send alerts. And now it's become fairly standard. For a decade, I watched what people clicked at Day Watch. We had tens of thousands of subscribers, and I ran that from 2000 to 2009. And, and within Tribune Company, which at that point included the Los Angeles Times, New York's Newsday, the Baltimore Sun, many other newspapers with big audiences, um, Daywatch often led all of them with 60% click-through rates, 60 clicks for every 100 recipients. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, it worked. The things that I'm about to tell you are effective. So, 
One example, post-Tribune, a major professional organization that followed the advice you're about to get after I was embedded with the team for about four days, a site that previously hadn't strung together two successive months of record traffic, achieved record page views for the next five straight months and for 10 of the following 12 months. Offline, I'll tell you which organization that was. Based here in Chicago, it kind of does legal kind of stuff. Uh, more recently, I just launched Chicago Public Square business cards out there. Please take them. I hope you'll subscribe. It's awesome. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> you heard it. Um, it's uh, very much like what I used to do at Daywatch. It's a daily email news briefing. It's a newscast by email. And uh, just launched January 30th. And we have what, I, what MailChimp tells me are industry-leading metrics. Main factor driving the increase in engagement for my client that I just mentioned, stronger headlines. Again, the same advice you're about to get here on their website, primarily in email, because email helped them figure out what headlines would work well on their website and in other platforms and social media. But you or some of your skeptical colleagues may ask, isn't email dead? Don't young people not use email? Well, in my role as college professor and in my role as lecturer to groups like this over the last several months, I've asked people this question, young people in particular. Do you check Facebook, Twitter, and email regularly? And I'll ask you, raise your hand if you do all of those things regularly, however you define it. Do you check all three at least once a day? Raise your hand if you do, almost everybody. When you check them, do you scroll all the way back to the last one you looked at. I'm not talking about opening, but do you look at all of them you looked at that, you, that you've missed since the last time you checked in? On Twitter, anybody? If you follow any more than a few people on Twitter, there's almost no way you can see everything. On Facebook, do you look at everything that's come in since the last time you opened Facebook? Fatigue sets in very quickly. <laughs> on email, do you look from the first thing you open the, that you see to the last time you looked at email? Raise your hand. I want to clear. Everybody does. Now, you may not open every one of those emails. If you do, I'll be impressed. But at least you look at the subject lines. So you see, we all see the subject line of almost every email we get, except those that are diverted to spam. And that's true of young people. It's true of old people. Same response, regardless of demographics. <coughs> people may not like email. People may not respond to email. I know my kids don't answer my email, but I think they see it. One of the cool things about email is that you're reaching your core audience. At least they're seeing your email. These are people who have given you their email address, which most of us don't do lightly. And whether they know it or not, they're sharing their interests with you. Email awaits their attention, as you've just demonstrated. Unlike the rivers of social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, and one of the cool things about email, although you can do A-B testing, is it's fixed. Unlike, say, the front page of a website where the pieces are always moving around. It's very difficult when you look at Google Analytics or any other website metrics to determine whether something is doing well just because it's been there longer than the rest of the things or because it's been in that position longer uh, or because it's innately popular. It's hard to tell. But email is fixed. Everybody if you choose, sees the same thing, same time. And so it's an easier gauge of elements relative popularity, especially when you look at, as we will later, including some examples from some of you, heat maps or click maps, which make patterns pretty easy to spot if you look at them with a critical eye or two eyes. And one of the cool things about email is it's Facebook independent. It's free of the algorithms that Twitter and Facebook and the other social media platforms choose to apply to whatever other forms of communication that you have. These are, it's a direct channel to people who have an affinity with you and your organization. To get that intelligence from email, though, you need people to open it. And the key to doing that, I hope you'll be reassured to hear, is good old-fashioned writing. And I'm a fan of writing. One of the reasons I went into radio news is because I love the word. And unlike television, for instance, it really is all about words and to some extent about reading. But 
in the end, it's about writing. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of writing. This is about writing. Some of the secrets to getting people to pay attention to radio and, as it turns out, just about anything that you create on the web and in the digital space is really old advice. Strunk and white, almost 100 years ago, omit needless words. There's nothing new about that, but it's a lesson that easily and often is forgotten by those of us who create, in this case, email, email subject lines. More to come. I think some vivid examples that I hope will make the point. And certainly this is true on Twitter, 140 characters, and in texting, and on tiny smartphone screens that truncate your subject lines. Make your most interesting word or phrase the first element, the first word of your headline or subject line or your post, and let your writing flow from there. At least get it as high as you can in a subject line, in a tweet, in a Facebook post. The client that I haven't named, after four days of work, we sat down and I challenged them to give me some content that they thought should have gotten a bigger audience and that hadn't gotten a big audience. Something they thought would be relevant still. And we workshopped word for word the Facebook post using the principles that we had discussed and that we here will discuss. By the end of the day, I'm told that Facebook post generated more traffic than any other link on their website. And this is one of the fundamental principles. Make the most interesting word first. And now you may ask, would anyone like to ask? <laughs> Go ahead, someone ask. What are interesting words? What are the most interesting words? <laughs> well, uh, of course, <coughs> you probably have an innate sense already what your audience likes, but you certainly can check on the wider world's interest by going to a site like Google Trends and seeing what's trending. Now, much of that may not be useful for you at any given time. Trump is probably often going to be there, for instance, and you may have no content that has any intersection whatsoever with President Trump, but it's good intel to have. If the world is interested in Trump or 100 days, as might be the case today, and you have some content that is relevant to 100 days, perhaps a collection of books about the 100 days of previous presidents might be an opportunity for you to jump on that social media gravy train with a timely email or tweet or Facebook post. But again, more immediately and more usefully, I think, you want to develop, and you, again, probably already have developed, whether you realize it or not, an innate sense of what your audience already values by looking at your clicks. Um, I'm guessing for each of you, you probably already have a sense of words or phrases that you know will generate interest. Anybody? And they may differ from, they probably will differ from town to town. Anybody know some, a word or a phrase that, that is sort of your go-to, oh, people will be interested in this? Anybody? Speak loudly. Donuts. Donuts. <laughs> Donuts works. That uh, April Fool's edition I showed you from Chicago Public Square was uh, fun. Um, yes? Free. Free? Yeah, that's one that works for any audience anywhere. <laughs> Free is a very powerful word. And <coughs> while you don't want to use it gratuitously, if it's appropriate, it's really hard to beat as the first word of your subject line <coughs> or the second word or the third word, or as high as you can get it. I want to assure you this isn't about a word I really don't like, clickbait. It's used largely, to my experience, by old school journalists who uh, just want ink on their hands and aren't interested in caring about whether their audience or their work connects with an audience. It's used to dismiss any sort of thought about the audience at all. This is about good headlines and bad headlines. And again, headlines could be tweets, Facebook posts, whatever. Good headlines connect content to the maximum number of people to whom it's relevant and useful. They begin with the most interesting words. They're brief. They omit needless words. 
They create a curiosity gap, more on that to come. Bad headlines fail to connect content with people who'd find it useful and relevant. They're long, boring, irrelevant. They don't spotlight interesting words. And they don't generate any curiosity. Or, and this is probably closer to what many people think of when they think of clickbait, they connect content with people to whom it's neither useful nor relevant, turning them off to future communication. They're teases that don't deliver. Would you do this? <laughs> Using your name, perhaps? I hope not. <laughs> Except as a joke, on April Fool's, maybe. A lot of companies, and maybe even your organizations, do that. Here's some common mistakes. Echoing the from field in the subject. Redundancy, waste of precious space. Repeating the subject from day to day is a problem. Have you ever lined up uh, email? You've gone through your email box and said, well, let me see all the email that Acme Corporation has sent me. Ever done that? Yep. Do find and all the Acme email lines up. If all the headlines are exactly, all the subject lines are exactly the same, what do you do? Speak loudly, please. Delete. Do you open any of them? No. If the headline is exactly the same, you have no way of determining whether there's anything for you there. And if you've opened even one before, you probably have a preconceived notion of what's in there. And you delete them all. That's what happens on a day-by-day -day basis when you use the same subject line you've used before. So don't do that. Another common mistake. No interesting words first in the subject line. Tidbits is a wonderful email newsletter all about Apple and Macintosh products. They've been doing this forever, but I already know it's from them. I already know what day it is. I don't need the subject line to tell me what day it is or what day it was sent because there's a date right there in any email client you use. And I certainly don't need to know the issue number. No one cares about the issue number. Um, when you open email, think about this. I want to analyze this step by step. When you get email, when you open your email box and look at your email box, what's the first thing you look at? The sender. The sender. And depending on who the sender is, then you look at subject line. If you don't know the sender or the sender isn't of interest to you, do you open the email? No. The from field determines whether you open, I mean, first of all, is the primary determinant of whether you're going to open an email. Then the subject line determines. If it's from mom or dad or the boss, you're probably going to open it. If it's from your organization and they've already given your email address, you have a leg up on someone who's writing to somebody without having a pre-existing relationship. But then it's the subject line. So uh, thinking back to you know, the, the, all the headlines the same, all the subject lines the same, compare that to these. If you've done a search of your email inbox to find all the email from this sender, what would you do here? Anybody? Would you delete them all? No. Would you open some? That's better than deleting them all, right? And again, this is in the aggregate, but this is what happens at a microscopic level with every email that you send. If you change the email subject line, you have a fighting chance of getting someone's attention. Don't use the same subject line again and again and again and again and again. What's the difference here? I've given you some help. Interesting words. Interesting words. As our old friends at Strunk and White, The Elements of Style, one of my favorite books on writing, say, use definite, specific, concrete language. Concrete language, words that put pictures in your head. And you can see some good examples here of words that put pictures in people's heads. 
Brand names, for better or worse, put pictures in people's heads. Companies have spent gazillions of dollars to make sure that when people see their corporate name, people get a picture in their head. So proper nouns like that are very effective. Note how few words you get, on especially on a smartphone screen. If the future is mobile, and I suspect if you look at your metrics, you'll see the number of people who are connecting with you, either on your website or in your email, via mobile devices is growing. It ain't going away. I don't know about you, but many is the time I will be sitting at a desktop computer, big screen, 28 inch diameter screen, um, diagonal screen, and yet I will take my smartphone out to check my email. Anybody else done that? I'm not that weird, am I? Okay. Mobile is where it's at. If your communication doesn't work on mobile, then you're missing a bet and you're missing the next generation for sure. Spreadsheets as a way to assess your success are almost useless. <laughs> they can be useful, but they don't provide the insight that you can get from heat maps. More to come. So what words interest your audience? You want to watch your clicks using what I call email content analysis, which works best if you use, as I say, heat maps, click maps. This is a screenshot from MailChimp. I'm going to take you back to uh, an example that I've come to like over the years. It's from my own work, and I'm going to be ruthless in criticizing it, and I hope you'll join me. This goes back to about 19, I'm sorry, 19, 2007. This is from the middle of an issue of Daywatch. About 30 links, and these are three in the middle. You want to look for clusters of little clicked items among more clicked items. Red, more clicked, yellow, less clicked. People didn't get to that third link without at least looking at the second link. What's going on there? Why did they not click on that link in the same numbers they clicked on the link above or below? Again, this is a general interest, probably for our purposes in 2007, relatively young and relatively tech-savvy audience opening Chicago Tribune email, getting their news digitally as opposed to um, on paper. Um, why did that audience not find that middle link quite so much of interest? It's relevant just to people with kids. Didn't have that quick question opening the graph focus. Yep. I, th I think that's right. And it's difficult to be decisive about this by opening any one email and looking at it. But over the course of time, either with A-B testing or by trying the same thing in subsequent issues, which has the same effect, I can tell you, again, from watching numbers for 10 years, that's probably true. Relatively young audience. Probably not everybody's a parent. Can anybody think of a, a way that I, I might have, if I'd been smarter then than I was, I might have made that same story without changing the underlying content more interesting to more people? Lead with Shrek. Lead with Shrek, most interesting word, yes. Anything else? <laughs> Shrek gets slammed. <laughs> Leaving the kids out might have gotten more people to read that story. Now, there's a delicate balance there because would some people who don't have children and not care about childhood health be disappointed if they clicked on it? You want to be careful of that. In retrospect, I don't think so. I think that, you know, the, the idea that uh, the use of an animated character in ads targeted at children would have been something that everyone would have found interesting. But the presentation here clearly made it easy for some people to say, I'm not interested in that. There's real tension between us as content creators and distributors and an audience that is fundamentally looking for reasons not to click. We're all in a hurry. We're all trying to get to something else. And we're looking, at least that's the way I am, and that's based on my experience studying audience behavior. That's the way most people are. We're fundamentally selfish. Yeah, we'll look, but we're kind of hoping that we can just get out of this and get back to watching Handmaid's Tale or whatever we happen to be watching. 
Okay, well, what happened in that uh, third one, which is the most clicked of these three links? Theories? It's at the end, well, and actually this is the middle of the issue. Remember these are three, there's a screenshot from the middle of the issue. It is at the bottom of the three, but it's not the last link in the issue. It's unanswered. It's unanswered. It's short, it's no-brainer. Well, what, what does no-brainer, what's the implication of that phrase, no-brainer? What? It's a quick and easy fix. It's quick and easy fix. What does it tell you is going to happen if you click on that link? I'll get it immediately. You will get an answer. Contrast that to the first one, which again got a lot of clicks. I, and if I had been thinking, and I, I, I think I was thinking at that point, I probably thought that first one was the more interesting. My goal, and your goal as a content creator, really should be to align your presentation with your audience's interest. Imagine, think back to that donut example I showed you. Every link was about donuts for April Fools. Imagine an email where every link is exactly as interesting as the one before it and after. If that were the case, which would be the most clicked link in the issue? The first one. Which would be the least clicked? The middle. The middle. Interesting. <laughs> Any other theories? Because you skim. You skim. You, your, your theory is you jump to the bottom. Right. But, but imagine that it's difficult to jump because every link is exactly as interesting as the one before. My theory is that if every link was interesting, the last one would be the least, because you wouldn't be able to skip any of them. But by definition, you'd be pulled away by a phone call or a crying kid or a doorbell or whatever, and you wouldn't get to the end. So in, a, in my mind, in a perfectly constructed email where you have aligned yourself completely with your audience's interest, the first link will be the most clicked. So when something diverts from that, whether, you know, if you imagine a curve starting at the top and working its way down toward the bottom of the issue, something diverts from that path. Something in the middle gets more clicks than you expect or less clicks. The audience is telling you something. You're not aligned with them. So uh, the fact that the first of these three links did not get as much engagement as the last, in retrospect, has told me something. What's, what didn't quite work as well there as it could have? There's one word I've come to question here that I think, in a sense, metaphorically shot me in the foot. What word do you think discouraged engagement here? Mysterious. mysterious. Who said mysterious? Why did you say mysterious? I don't think you're going to get an answer. I don't think you're going to get an answer. In contrast to that third item, which more or less guarantees you're going to get an answer. That sort of utility, you will get an answer. We're telling you something that's interesting, and you will find out more about it by clicking on this link, is a really powerful bit of structure. More to come. Here's a cluster of links. This was at the bottom of, I think, the same issue. Two links really got clicked a lot. What's going on? And, and some didn't get clicked. The first one, which you'd expect, in my hypothesis, to get the most clicks, didn't. Theories? Boring? <laughs> yeah? Well, the, I, the, the HD television, that was probably very timely. 2007, yeah. yeah. How to, again, what does it tell you? You're going to get something here. Yeah. yeah. Money. Yeah, the picture doesn't actually go with the most, the picture goes with Pluto. Right. Uh, which didn't, and I, I, w I might have thought the picture would have drawn more attention to that story, but it didn't really help much in, this, in that context. The most clicked link is shipwreck. shipwreck. Why? Millions, five hundred million. <laughs> People say that. I can tell you with authority after watching years and years of clicks. Dollar figures don't. I mean, once you get past, you know, walking around money. Shipwreck. And, and again, this is something that you might not have determined from one issue, but I can say with authority after watching what people click on the front page of a major metropolitan newspaper website,
that serves a populace that happens to have a very large body of water in its front or backyard. Shipwreck is a really powerful word. That's one of those words that works, at least for the Chicago Tribune audience. It may work for others elsewhere. It may work for your audience. I can't say with authority. You will be the experts on your, you know more about your audience than I do. But these kinds of principles apply to helping you figure out what works. So uh, two kinds of headlines. Um, search engine optimized headlines, you've heard about that. We're not going to talk much about that. Headlines for robots, as my friend Annie Crestadina, based in Chicago here, calls them. They're good for placement on the, on the website page that the audience will be winding up on. And then I like to think of them as curiosity gap optimized headlines, or as Andy calls them, headlines for people. These are the headlines used on the front page of a website. They are subject lines in your email. Uh, they are your social media words and phrases. For all headlines, SEO headlines, headlines for robots, headlines for people, put the story's most relevant word or phrase as close as possible to the start of the headline. There's a game you can buy. I've never actually played it, but it's uh, put together by New York newspaper veterans. Um, you play a game with cards, and you write headlines, and different words have different point values. And it's good to think of every word in your subject line, every word in your post, as having some point value that you associate with your audience. I don't really care what the point values are, but it's worth saying, you know, shipwrecks, that's a 25-point word for me when I was working at the Chicago Tribune. You probably have some 25-point words that free is one of them. Free might be a 100-point word. Um, headlines for robots are the really stupid, simple headlines that tell the story plainly. This one would tell you if you were interested in body mod, modern body mod magazine, you'd find that through Google. Or if you were interested in executive tattoos, you'd find that through Google. Headlines for humans, again, more interesting and more really what I think you're here to talk about. They talk about, they set up a, a, a standard, they set the stage for the difference between what you know and what you want to know. And this is a great quote from the late David Carr writing the New York Times about The Onion. And he's talking about how The Onion will write their headlines first before they create the content. And increasingly in my content strategy practice, when I'm working with people who are creating podcasts, who are creating email, I encourage them to say, before you do any work, you ought to have some headlines in mind that will guide you in the creation of this audio, for instance, so that you can, as you go through and edit all the audio, decide audio, decide does that fit with that headline. And you may need to adjust the headline as you go, but having the subject line, the headline, the tweet in mind first can be a real helpful standard against which you can measure your work. Again, this concept of assuming most people think they aren't interested. They're busy, they're selfish, they've got other things to do. You want to write headlines for those people. Yes, you probably have your loyalists who you know open every email. Your board members, your library faithful who are there day in and day out, who love the library, they're with you. The growth comes when you create something that they want to share with people who aren't already in your circle. When you get people who aren't normally part of your core, that's a success. You want to write your headlines for those people, your subject lines, your tweets, your Facebook posts. Play down location generally, um, except locations well known to your audience, and that will differ by market. Play down names of people who aren't familiar with everybody. Obama? Yeah, everybody knows. Trump? Yeah, everybody knows. Name of a member of your library board? Probably not all that well known. Probably doesn't belong in the subject line of your email. In any headline for humans, I recommend avoiding acronyms. It's the crack cocaine of headline writing. They're not going to be known by 100% of your audience. And you should aspire to use words that people, that 100% of your audience will recognize. If you're using words that 100% of your audience doesn't recognize, well, that percentage that doesn't recognize it is probably inclined not to click not to engage with you. Headlines for humans, questions work. We've demonstrated that. 
ellipses. Some editors really get upset with these, but if you deliver what's coming at the other end, it can work. <laughs> Pull quotes very powerful. Buzzfeed, you won't believe, can work really well, but be advised that you'd better deliver something that we won't believe because once or twice, you know, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me, shame on everybody if you fooled anybody anytime. Um, for all headlines, you again, I can't repeat this enough, apparently. Most interesting word first. And you, like free, is a very powerful word. It works in almost all contexts. I love this from The Onion, and it's very small on my screen, so I have to squint. In a piece of writing that had you intrigued from the very first clause, a second person narrative you are reading right at this very moment is absolutely captivating you, <laughs> et cetera. It's a good, good piece. And yes, it's funny, but it's funny because it's true. So put it all together, and you get what might be the most clicked or most read headline ever. <laughs> I always have to give credit to my fellow Oak Park resident, Paul Muth, uh, who was with me at the Tribune at the time. He recommended this based on, he heard me ranting as I'm ranting to you now about what made a good headline. And he said, so Charlie, you're saying the best headline ever might be someone you know is dead. <laughs> and this touches on something that I think we all need to bear in mind. We're all human. And, and you know, I, I've talked to people who work for trade publications who believe that their audience is absolutely interested in nuclear research or annual reports. We're all interested in sex, death, celebrities, puppies, kitties. <laughs> and this touches, this touches on a couple of those. Celebrity, someone you know, that's the definition of celebrity. And dead, of course, touches on death. So you want to try to get as close to these as you can. And obviously, it won't work for you all the time, every time. But if you have a celebrity, if you have death, if you have puppies, if you have kitties, consider that a good hook to get people to find out about everything else you want them to find out about. <laughs> this would be a slightly better headline. I'm not rec it won't work for everybody, but if you have something that's reasonably close to that and it's relevant to your subject matter, you could do worse. I, I just can't imagine see I mean, if I were to see this headline on the front page of the New York Times, I would click. <laughs> Is there anyone here who would not? <laughs> Once. And the case for sentence case, and I'm running long, so I'm going to move through this quickly. Um, we may you, as well as I, may be inclined by nature of training to want to capitalize every word in a subject line. But remember that concrete nouns drive traffic, words that put people's, that pictures in people's heads. And the most concrete concrete nouns are, as I hope we've demonstrated, proper nouns, names of people, places, things, corporations. So I encourage you to make those proper nouns more visible by not capitalizing every darn word in your subject line. And here's a very quick demonstration that I'm not going to take the time to let you work through, but you can imagine that every word here is capitalized, and you have to find only the proper nouns. But then imagine only the proper nouns are capitalized. I think you'll see that they're easier to spot here. World and trade and center are proper nouns here because they're part of the World Trade Center in this context. So I encourage you not to capitalize every word. Okay, now we're gonna now the fun part. We get to analyze stuff. This is um, out of courtesy to CBS. I blurted out. This is from several years ago, and I asked college students when I showed them this. Does anybody know what a circular is? And I assure you that v almost none of them knew what the word circular meant. So I hope you'll agree it's not a good word to put in a subject line. What does local mean? I mean, what's the goal of using local here? Uh, relevant, right? It's in the internet age, I'm not sure that local really means anything. I mean, Amazon is local because they deliver to my doorstep. 
Dunkin' Donuts, based on the East Coast, is local because they got a store next to me. There's the time, because that's the time, you know, it shows up, every email that I get. Check out, does check out add anything? Remember the email I showed you at the beginning? And that's a real library. That's a we love, check it out. Yeah, it basically means open, right? Yeah. Or read? Yeah. Well, it's useless information. Open this email from me. This week, well, I know what week it is. I don't need you to tell me what week. We don't even know what that word is because it's not there completely, although we can guess that it is unbeatable, which is a fairly interesting word. Is it the most interesting word you see there? Yeah. Here's the full subject line. What's the most interesting word? Discounts. Yes. Is it the first? No, it didn't even show up on the, on the screen. So not a good subject line. And here's what a circular is. It's a newspaper ad. So it wasn't really very useful. And you can bet that I would not open, I don't think anyone would open a second email with the same subject line, having experienced that. Bottom line here, <laughs> and, and this is really the essence of my preaching to you, don't be boring. Have I talked too long? You have not at all. I know people have questions. Um, we can, are you able to stay for lunch? I'm, I, I came for the lunch. <laughs> the, le <laughs> the, lecture, the lecture was just extra. Sandwiches. Like, <laughs> that's right. Sandwiches. You had me at sandwiches. Sandwiches here. And um, I know some people might have to run, but I know that Charlie will be here. We can eat. You can ask questions then. Does that sound good to everybody? Yes. Yeah. Okay, but thank you. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>